Tom here from Lawrence Systems. Firewalls, they were once a simple tool, but now have become a marketing buzzword, a feature checklist, and a full-blown routing and VPN platform with built-in threat intelligence and sometimes a bit of cloud magic sprinkled in. But how did we get here? To understand a modern firewall, we need to rewind. Back in the early days, firewalls, routing, VPN, and many other functions were distinct and separate components. Firewalls filter traffic based on rules, routers move packets from A to B, and then NAT came along as a temporary fix for IPv4 exhaustion so multiple devices could share one public IP address. And if you're interested in that little piece of history and how NAT came to be, the Serial Port channel has a great video on that topic where you'll find linked in the description below. But my goal today is not to cover the history, but to cover the modern version and definition of the firewall. That, thanks to conveniences, some cost-cutting and clever engineering has all these features crammed into a single box. Which means, when most people talk about a firewall, they're really talking about a multifunction edge device that does it all. NAT, filtering, VPN, threat detection, and often DNS and DHCP in the small business market. So to keep this video focused and concise, I'm going to refer to the modern firewall as that type of all-in-one box, so we can talk about what it does well, what it doesn't do well, and how encryption, remote work, and the rise of zero trust has forced us to rethink what a firewall can and should be doing here in 2025. My goal is not to downplay the importance of the modern firewall, but instead discuss where it fits into your security stack. And to keep this topic firewall vendor agnostic, this video is not brought to you by a firewall or VPN vendor trying to rebrand the product as an AI-powered threat prevention magic box. But it is sponsored by our friends at Huntress, which is powered by real people doing real threat hunting. A seemingly normal login can be a red flag. It might not be you accessing your system, but a threat actor using stolen credentials. This is unwanted access. Huntress watches out for sneaky tactics and behaviors, like credential theft and session hijacking. With Huntress, you get their expert team monitoring your system 24-7, identifying and responding to threats early on. Protect your identity and your business from unwanted access, business email compromise, and more. Start your free trial today with Huntress Managed ITDR. The first thing I want to talk about is encryption, because firewalls and encryption aren't necessarily friends. Matter of fact, if you dig around in the early days, especially the 90s when I started, pretty much nothing was encrypted, and we just used Telnet across the open internet to log into things that anyone could have, you know, picked up the traffic. This is why there's so much advice out there that really doesn't hold up quite as well today. But when people say, well, don't connect to some random network, especially Wi-Fi networks, because all your traffic could be inspected. And well, seeing as most sites are encrypted now, that's really not the case. But in the early days, that certainly was an issue. And this is from the Electronic Frontier Foundation and some reports they did. I'll leave a link to it down below. But it's the percentage of web pages loaded by Firefox, their telemetry system, and how that impacted security. So you can see in the early days, there was only under 40%. And then all the way up to when the study was on 2023, over 90% for the USA users and aggregated across all users, you have quite a bit of encryption going on. And this is coinciding as well. This is part of what the EFF was talking about is Let's Encrypt had a major role in that because Let's Encrypt made this easy to do and automated certificates. So everyone just started putting them on there. And many of the sites that aren't encrypted, there's still a small percentage of them now that are not, they're not as important. And I say that because they are usually sites that are someone's blog or some old site that doesn't have a login. So outside of being able to inspect the traffic, there's not necessary security risk other than a privacy risk of perhaps someone seeing your traffic and being inspected. Now let's get to how firewalls in their most basic form work. You have your private network, thanks to NAT, and that allows the public IP to sit on the firewall, and then we have the internet, and then we get to some service online. And in early days, as I said, most of these protocols weren't encrypted, so tools like Squid Proxy could see, filter, and cache traffic. Cache was a big help, especially back when I worked at a larger company. I set up their Squid caching server because we were a transportation provider, and there were 10 dispatchers constantly checking the weather, and we, at the time, only had a T1, and it was a fraction T1, which meant that's not a lot of speed. And of course, caching is a big help in that situation. You have many people accessing similar resources. We're less bandwidth constrained today. And with encryption, it breaks a lot of these things. Caching is not really that big of a deal. There are limited niche use cases for it. Then came next gen firewalls because the internet, as it got bigger, meant, well, there was profit to be made by getting into and creating havoc with security. And 
The threats were basic in the early days, but we used the next gen term in the marketing world. Next gen really meant we were throwing Snort and Sericata. Snort was first, Sericata came later, and they were both probably the de facto things that you found on here. Of course, we still had limited block lists. They came from spam and kind of pivoted over to something similar to firewalls where we block different countries and geo-blocking, et cetera. But this still had some level of effectiveness because in these early days when these products first came out and they're still widely used today, it was unencrypted and easy to inspect. You would just look for patterns. And the pattern matching was interesting because they would discover a pattern. They would load it into Snort as part of the rules. It would say, if we see someone doing this type of thing, it's probably this type of attack. Once again, with unencrypted traffic, this was effective. So when people say, well, doesn't Snort or Sarah or insert name of traffic inspection will just solve a lot of these security problems. Well, they used to. This is where things started getting a little bit more challenging because here in 2025, approximately 95% of websites utilize HTTPS. And kind of, as I mentioned, the few sites that don't use it are probably not the most important sites and are certainly not your major sites. Major sites and application sites pretty much universally use a encrypted connection, which means with the encrypted connection between the some service online and your device that's accessing that service, it's encrypted and it blinds the firewall or anything in between. Because the idea isn't to blind a firewall, that's actually a side effect. The idea of having something encrypted was to have a secure connection between the thing you're accessing and your system. And all the way up here in TLS 1.3, it has included perfect forward secrecy, which is the secondary exchange that happens to create an ephemeral or expiring key that is just for that session. This really is a great implementation, but of course this is wonderful for privacy and security and terrible for anyone who wants to do all the traffic inspection on a firewall. The firewall can still see the IP address. And if it's not encrypted, it can see DNS and SNI or server name indicator. Because the first step in the process when you ask for a certificate isn't just going to the IP or going to the website. It's going, hey, I would like to access this site because one IP address for some service may have many different sites. So one of the things you have to include, and this is before the encryption starts, is the server name indicator. This is what firewalls can key on for filtering. So that server name is sent and said, I would like a certificate for lawrencesystems.com. And it looks and goes, hey, I have a certificate for that. And it sends a certificate and then the security starts. Now the firewall only got to see what name there was for the website, but they don't get to see any sub names after that. So if it's Lawrence Systems slash some other resource, well, you're not going to be able to see that. It only sees the name that was requested. This does allow for some basic filtering. And so many firewalls that have what they refer to as layer seven filtering can still be effective with that, but it's limited. They're not seeing exactly all the details. Also, encrypted hello, ESNI, there's other things out there at play that aren't really here and fully used in 2025, but they're coming where there's a level of encryption going on. So you would then lose that. And of course, this blinds the firewall again. Now, blocking IPs and DNS can still work, provided the firewall is even the source of DNS. Smaller networks, yes. Larger enterprise networks, not necessarily. Usually Active Directory or some other server is going to be the source of truth for DNS. And it becomes just much less effective, especially when you talk about IP blocking, because modern threats are using things like the mention of SNI going to a common single IP address. So if that single IP address is set up with something like a Cloudflare and a Cloudflare CDN with a tunnel, you can't just block it by IP because you can have an SNI header that sends a request for badwebsite.com and you want to block that. But if I blocked it by IP and there was other services on that CDN, well, if that important service you need is also on that CDN, blocking IPs just becomes a less effective way to do it. It's not 100% dead, but it just doesn't have the same impact based on modern security threats. Doesn't installing certs and all the hosts solve this problem though? Because then we'd have full visibility again. Ah, yes, firewalls and encryption. And this is where we install a cert. We take a cert and we put it on the firewall. We put it on the endpoint. And this effectively makes the firewall have visibility into the encrypted traffic. There's some issues though. Only solves for hosts that can have a cert installed. You can't always install a cert. Not all devices have that ability, especially if it's an IoT device. Well, those are just broken at that point. And this is one of the reason we put them on separate networks to kind of mitigate any issues that may come with them. But there's also just a lot of other maybe printers and other devices on the network that it can become a pain to put them on separate networks. And it's also a pain to inspect their traffic because they may not have a way to install that trusted cert. And managing all those trusted certs can 
be its own challenge. Everyone thinks it's a good idea. And anyone who's done it in the corporate world nods their head and go, yeah, I remember that time it all broke because it can be challenging. It also breaks if the client app uses certificate pinning. Look at it, you, Microsoft apps or security apps or Google apps or many different things because it does not solve this issue of the man in the middle. And yes, the firewall becomes the, well, as it's called now, adversary in the middle, AITM. So man in the middle is the old word. AITM is the new phrasing we use for that. But the adversary in the middle, it also creates a big security problem because if someone attacks your firewall, they now have visibility into everything, all the traffic that all the endpoints are doing. Why well, get to the endpoint and see the traffic? I can see if I mess with the firewall and I manage to get access to this, that would put me in a position to see all passwords that are being logged into all websites. Matter of fact, if you're able to clone that traffic, I would be able to even get the whole session token and everything to be able to steal the identity, including the multi-factor that you put in. So this is a, to me, the centralizing of a potential threat. So I'm not big on it. This is what people ask a lot is, Tom, isn't this a solution? Why are you not for it? Or And it's just, it's not a great idea. It's a band-aid on the problem, not really the problem. I focus much more on endpoint security because, well, endpoint security is where things are happening. And on the endpoint, by the way, it's already decrypted. So you don't have to get in the middle to use any of the filtering tools out there. Now, I'll admit, I only know of really good commercial tools. There's not a lot in the open source world that manages the endpoint and manages the security of different websites. But I've talked about that before on the channel and I've got a whole another video you'll find linked down below talking about how inspection and traffic is done. And the final problem, of course, ever since 2020, work from home has become much more popular. And this is a challenge. If the host isn't behind a firewall, having a certificate doesn't help. Unless, of course, you're trying to do a full tunnel and every time they open up the device that is outside the firewall they're VPNing in and wrapping all their traffic in there. That's another way to solve it. But once again, not the best way to solve it. And you're still dealing with all the other issues that I mentioned. Is next gen firewall dead? Well, no, but, and I know all that inspection stuff sounds great. And it's not dead though. And let's talk about where firewalls are here in 2025. They are still a layer in your security, but just, I really hope not your only layer. You still need to route traffic. You probably still need the VPN or whatever services it provides. And there is some effectiveness to some of these block lists. There's definitely amateurs out there. They don't go away. They just can't pick on the people who have better security. So this is the concept of running faster than the thing chasing you. You don't have to run faster than the bear. You only have to run faster than each other person that's slower than the bear because they'll catch up with them and maybe they'll catch up to you. But better idea for security really is having a lot more layers and not just depending on these block lists. So there's the less sophisticated attacks that are probably still going to be effective when it comes to the older things that are out there in your firewall being able to block them. But it doesn't really protect you against modern, much more sophisticated attacks, which are becoming a lot more common because of the layers and cat and mouse race that is security. Now, how does zero trust play into this and why does it matter? And what does it have to do with firewalls? And let's talk about zero trust architecture, not from the marketing buzzwords that we'll get to in a moment, but what it actually means as defined by NIST. NIST zero trust is a security model that assumes no user or device is trusted by default, even inside the network and requires continuous verification of identity, device health and access context before granting or maintaining access to the resource. And this means we don't say, hey, once they're behind the firewall, they're in. This is the you know wonderful movie trope that we see. We've got past the firewall, we've gotten in, therefore we have access. No, in a zero trust world, you can be positioned with a VPN and VPNs can be a part of that where you get into the network, but that doesn't grant you access to the resource necessarily. It brings you to the next login screen. It's part of layering your security. And firewalls do play a role in this to an extent. But more specifically, I want to talk about Zero Trust and Overlay VPN. An Overlay VPN helps with Zero Trust by creating a secure encrypted tunnel per user, per device, or even per application, regardless of where the user is located and enforcing identity-based access controls rather than relying on network location. So instead of trying to configure the inbound VPN and then putting the user on the right network and hoping they 
only have access to these resources or creating tons of firewall rules around that user and the IP address assigned to them, you do it differently with overlay VPNs. And some of the overlay VPNs can run on the firewall as well. So that may be the point at which they run. Because you can't always integrate them to every device. You can't always integrate the overlay VPN into every application. But those applications may sit behind the firewall. And this gives you a ingress method that doesn't necessarily in many overlay VPN setups require you to open any specialized ports and it allows the user to have the host behind a firewall or not behind a firewall and it can dynamically shift as needed to be able to access the application. But the important parts of it and how it relates to zero trust is it works even when the host or application is not behind a particular firewall. Hence the work from home problem we get, we can solve with a overlay VPN. Authenticate the user device identity. So we want to make sure we've validated that this person is who they say they are and they're allowed to access those resources. Some, and this is depending on what overlay VPN software you use, they can also look at the device and verify its security posture. Is it running the tools you expect? Is it patched? Is it secure based on rules that you have configured? You know, or is someone tampered with it? This is what stops overlay VPNs from easily being transported and just loaded somewhere else because that extra level of verification is often built into the application for the overlay VPN tool. And then we're enforcing access controls only to the specific apps or services, not the whole subnet. When you get granular with an overlay VPN, you're connecting it to the resources. So we load the user into our overlay VPN software and we say, this user has access to only these resources. So where they are in the network doesn't matter. The overlay VPN is bridging them to the resources you allow them access to and no more. This is kind of the combination of Zero Trust and Overlay VPN. All right, now let's put our marketing hat on because didn't you just use a lot more words to describe what we use the acronym SASE for? Well, marketing uses SASE. SASE is the sales and marketing buzzword, but overlay VPNs are what actually gets the job done. Encrypting traffic, verifying identity, enforcing least privilege access without turning your network into a trust free for all. Secure access edge service is just the latest in a buzzword soup that marketing will slap on products, call it a cloud driven firewall or whatever the buzzwords are. I try to cut through the buzzwords and look for the functional things and how they're working. You know, it's the same way we called firewalls next generation because we threw some threat monitoring on them. And that word has stuck with every firewall because I think every firewall is next generation, but then watch people squabble because if a firewall doesn't have a feature of another one, but they both called them next generation, well, we're back to just referring to marketing terms. Overlay VPN is a much more specific term for the functional way things are getting done. But I will admit, yes, it is also frequently called if you're trying to look at some of the products, it might be referred to as sassy. We're about 17 minutes into this video, and since you made it this far, I hope this gives you a better understanding as to why I say firewalls play a smaller part in protecting you against modern threats here in 2025. If you've got thoughts, questions, or different takes about today's topic, drop them in the comments down below. I always enjoy hearing and learning from all of you. For deeper technical dives and ongoing discussions, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we've got a great community of people just like you to engage with on this and other topics. If you want to help support the channel and what I do here, check out our swag store or Patreon. Don't forget to like and subscribe, click that notification bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. And if you're looking to connect with me or learn more about the services we offer, head over to Lawrence Systems. Dot com. You'll find links to my socials and more ways to get in touch. Thanks for watching. And remember, security is built in layers. Marketing buzzwords don't solve security issues. And threat actors are more likely to log in than break in. Therefore, you should stop reusing your passwords. Thanks.